Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we have with us William Larry Kidder uh, in honor of Patriots Week in Trenton. And he's going to be talking about the revolutionary world of a free, free black man, Jacob Francis, 1754 to 1836. Um, but before we jump into Larry's presentation, I just have some housekeeping items to go through. Um, First and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of Larry's presentation today, but please feel free at any time to submit them using the Q&A or the chat feature. Uh, this program is being recorded, so once it is up on our YouTube channel, I will make sure that everybody who registered gets a link to that recording, and please feel free to watch it again or share it. Um, Larry has graciously allowed us uh, to do that. Um, I want to just let you know about some upcoming webinars that we have at the end of January. Um, one is on the 23rd, and it's on how to keep your New Year's resolution. And then the other one is on the 25th, and that one is titled Social Security 101. Uh, you can check out our website to keep up with our events and to register. Also, yesterday was a talk for Patriots Week called Strangely Contaminated, the Loyalist of New Jersey. If you're interested, it was recorded and it can be found on our YouTube channel. Uh, our next author talk is on January 12th, and it is on the Wallace House and the Old Dust Dutch Parsonage and the 25th or 125th anniversary that they will be celebrating. Uh, part of the talk follows the history of George Washington's winter headquarters at the Wallace House after the commander in chief's departure in June of 1779, and then tracing the transformation of Hope Farm, now called the Wallace House, from gentlemen's country retreat to historic house museum. So I hope you'll register to hear that talk on January 12th at noon. But for today, we have with us William Larry Kidder, historian and author. Larry received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Allegheny College in Pennsylvania, He's a retired high school history teacher who has also served in four years in the Navy. He has been the lead researcher and writer for the creation of the Admiral Arleigh Burke National Destroyer Museum aboard the destroyer museum ship USS Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. For more than 33 years, he has volunteered at the Howell Living History Farm located in Hopewell, serving as a historian, interpreter, and draft horse teamster. He is also a member of several historical associations. Uh, he has authored, edited, and contributed to more than five books and various articles on New Jersey history and the American Revolution. He has spoken at various civic DAR and SAR organizations, libraries, and has involved, been involved in Patriots Week in Trenton in various ways. He's an avid member of the Association for Living History, Farm and Agricultural Museums, the Washington's Crossing Roundtable of the American Revolution, the New Jersey Living History Advisory Council, and the Advisory Council for Crossroads of the American Revolution, where he also works with the latter as a volunteer on several projects. Welcome, Larry, and we look forward to hearing more from you. Um, one last thing before we jump in, I just want to go over a brief overview of the Zoom dashboard. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see your audio settings. If you're using an external listening device like a headset, you can make sure that the device is connected properly there. At any point during the presentation, if you have any issues, there is a raise hand button here in the middle. You can click on that. That'll alert me, and I will send you a message in Zoom to hopefully be able to solve that problem. And as I mentioned, if you do have a question, you can use the Q&A or the chat buttons at any time to send them to us, and Larry will happily answer them at the end of his talk. So that is everything that I have for you. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Larry. Thanks very much, Andrew. And let me get the share screen going here. Okay, hopefully everybody, everybody can see that now. Looks good. Okay, um, it's a great to be able to talk with you today about uh, Jacob Francis. Um, the title of the book that I wrote about him is very important to understand, The Revolutionary World of a Free Black Man. 
Notice it's not titled something like a biography of Jacob Francis. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, uh, Jacob Francis only left one documentary source um, in his own words, although he dictated it, he did not write it. He was, he was illiterate, he did not write. Um, and that's one reason why it's hard to, to know a great deal about him. What is easier to know about him is the world in which he lived, uh, the surroundings that he had, the, the people around him, the things going on around him and all of that. And in some cases, we have some indication of how he felt about things, uh, but in other places we don't. So we're looking at his world and trying to find out as much about him as an individual in that world as we can. I think that because we're talking about him during Patriots Week, it would be very uh, uh, proper to note that he did cross with General Washington on the night of December 25, 26, and he was at the, the Battle of Trenton. As we'll find out, uh, Jacob was born in New Jersey and uh, lived most of his life in New Jersey. But at the time he crossed the Delaware, he was associated with a Continental Regiment from another state. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, he may be the only, uh, one of the few or, or only Continentals who crossed with Washington. There were some uh, New Jersey state troops and a couple of militiamen who served as guides and that sort of thing for Washington. But there were no New Jersey Continental uh, units uh, that crossed. So that makes New Jersey men uh, relatively sparse. It may also be that he is the only or one of very few uh, Black New Jerseyans who crossed and uh, fought at the Battle of Trenton. So just to do a little background, because that's what we're looking at is the, the 10 crucial days. Once they got across the river, uh, Jacob was with uh, General Sullivan's division in the march uh, from McConkie's Ferry and uh, Johnson Ferry down to Trenton. And he is going through his old homeland, as we will see uh, when he does that. When he got to Trenton, and he does talk about the battle in uh, his pension application later on, which is that only document that we really have in, in his words. Uh, with Sullivan's uh, division, he was coming along the River Road, and they first encountered the outpost at Philmon Dickinson's Hermitage, uh, where the Hessian Jaegers were, the 50 or so of them. And they're going to force the Jaegers back into Trenton uh, in very wild retreat uh, because they were so badly outnumbered by uh, Sullivan's troops. Uh, Jacob talks about that and he mentions that when he got to the what would date today be the corner of State Street and Warren Street, he could look to his left up the street, which was then King Street, and he could see the main fighting uh, that was involved with Colonel Rawls regiment uh, and also the um, troops that came under General Green and General Washington to the upper part of, of Trenton. So he could, he could see all that going on. And he could also see that the 3rd uh, Hessian Regiment, the Knipphausen Regiment, was kind of heading towards him and, and his group. So his group split, uh, part of them going uh, down uh, Broad Street, what was then Queen Street, and then crossing over behind the, uh, the Aston Pink Creek uh, to Mill Hill area, and the others taking on the Knifhausen Regiment uh, in downtown Trenton, essentially today. Uh, Colonel Rawl and two regiments, the Rawl Regiment and the uh, Lossberg Regiment, uh, fought a battle just outside of Trenton in an apple orchard area, and they were uh, surrounded and surrendered. In the meantime, uh, Sullivan's troops were getting the Niffhausen Regiment to retreat. And once Rawls regiments had surrendered, that freed up uh, the troops uh, 
fighting him to join in with the uh, troops fighting the Knifhausen Regiment. And at this point, Jacob was over across the Assen Pink Creek and could see, could look across and saw the surrender, saw the uh, Hessians put their arms down, et cetera, and saw the, the end of the Battle of Trenton, which he comments on. After the battle, of course, he's going to go back uh, up to Johnson's fer uh, Ferry and across, and then he's going to cross back to Trenton in late December, right around the time that we're in now, the, the dates, the 29th, 30th or so of, of December. At this point, he's just about out of obligation to the Continental Army. His enlistment is going to expire on December 31st. He is not alone in that, as you probably know. You know that uh, so many of the troops, the uh, enlistment extended, uh, expired then. And Washington, you know, offered a bounty to men who would extend their enlistment for six weeks, uh, really gave them a, an extra month's pay, and they would get also paid for those, those six weeks. But um, Jacob didn't accept that offer. He had been in the Army for 14 months. And at this point, he was a survivor. Uh, most of the men in his regiment were no longer there. His regiment had uh, decreased from uh, around 500 down to perhaps less than 100. So the, between uh, battlefield deaths, um, wounded uh, soldiers that were taken out of service, uh, soldiers that deserted, uh, soldiers who um, just were sick, you know, and couldn't do it anymore. Uh, there, there were just so many reasons. The Army also owed him seven and a half months pay. Now, think about that. If he'd been in for 14 months, they owed him over half of his pay for the time that he had been in. And no real um, sign that this was going to be taken care of. So he was verbally discharged, and at that point, he was only given three months back pay. So if he's going to leave the Army, he still is owed uh, several months pay. He also needs to get a written discharge. Keep in mind, he is a free Black man in a Continental Army uniform, or what's left of it, and he's going to be walking around alone, and people are going to suspect he's a deserter. Uh, people are going to have all kinds of questions about him as a black man uh, that they, they don't know, uh, not obviously a, a member of their community. And for men in that situation, life could be really difficult. But he's going to do that anyway, and he's going to leave the army. So who was this guy? Okay. Well, he was a free black born in Janu January of uh, 1754. Now, I accentuate the fact that he was born free. His mother uh, was a free black woman uh, who lived in Amwell Township, uh, just north of today's Hopewell. And she herself was, was not enslaved, at least at the time that he was born. We don't know if she had been enslaved and set free. Um, we just don't know what her previous situation was, but she was definitely free at the time he was born. We don't know who his father was. Uh, he never knew who his father was. Uh, he never had any siblings that have ever been recorded. Uh, we only know about him and his mother. And we know from Jacob's own account that when he was a young boy, probably under 10 years of age, she uh, bound him out as an indentured servant, not as an enslaved person, but as an indentured servant uh, until the age of 21. In other words, she contracted out his labor to someone else until age 21. Uh, he was his time of indenture was owned successively by five different white men. The first three were farmers in the um, 
Amwell Township area, and two were merchants, uh, one in New York and the West Indies, the other in Massachusetts, and we'll see about them in just a second. But each man owned his time uh, individually, but then sold the remainder of it to another man uh, until Jacob reached the age of, of 21. He spent short times with, with three men in New Jersey, um, and then with the one merchant in New York who took him to the island of St. John in the West Indies. And then finally, he spent six and a half years between 1768 and 1775 in Salem, Massachusetts, working for a, a Salem merchant. Um, he got to know that family really well. He lived with them for, for six and a half years. And those were his formative years, of course. Uh, and think about his formative years being spent in Salem as the revolution is building and building and building and you know, virtually on, on the verge of breakout uh, in April of 1775. There are gonna be at least two different revolutions in Jacob's lifespan. One's gonna be the American Revolution that's going to really get into the stage of being a war for independence, uh, right about the time he becomes a free young adult at age 21. And the other is going to be a revolution in human rights, uh, rights for specifically, in his case, black people uh, who not only needed uh, to be free from uh, free from uh, enslavement, but just free in equal rights and, and representation uh, with whites. And that revolution, of course, continues today. But Jacob's life is, is really helping to understand both of those revolutions. Now, on January 15th, 1775 in Salem, this is when Jacob becomes free from his indenture. For the first time in his really remembered life, except for early childhood, he has been responsible to somebody else rather than himself for what he does uh, day to day. Uh, he's had to follow orders from somebody else. Um, he's also had to deal in a personal relationship uh, with a number of different people who he has been responsible to at one time or another. So he's really had a lot of human experience as well as a lot of work experience. The one thing about his work experience, uh, one thing that makes an indentured servant different from an apprentice is an apprentice is learning a skill, an indentured servant is just doing work and not necessarily learning a skill. So Jacob is, is, didn't learn something that he could then use for the, for the rest of his life. So now that he's free, what's he going to do? He could stay in Salem. He could get odd jobs. He might continue to work for the man who had owned his indenture time. Uh, there were some, some options there. But I think Jacob luck, thought of himself as being from New Jersey. Uh, he also uh, really had no roots other than with the family that had, he had been indentured to. One possibility comes up not too many months after his indenture, and that's to enlist in the Continental Army. Now. To me, that sounds a little uh, crazy <laughs> because joining the Continental Army was almost going to be like going back to being an indentured servant. He was going to lose control over deciding what to do with his time. The Army was going to tell him what to do, um, at least for a period of time, just like as an indentured servant, he was going to be told what to do for a period of time. So if he joins the Continental Army, he's going to be giving up some of that freedom uh, that he had. Even to join the Continental Army is going to be difficult for a free black man, whether he's from New Jersey or from Massachusetts or wherever, because there was a lot of disagreement. On October the 8th, Washington met with eight of his officers, including several from New England, where um, there was perhaps more empathy and more uh, willingness to work with, with, with black men in the Army. But these officers agreed unanimously that no slaves, no enslaved men would be allowed in the army. 
And by a great majority, they voted to reject Negroes or black men altogether from the army, free or enslaved. There happened to be a committee from the Continental Congress visiting Washington at Cambridge at the same time. And he put the question to them and they concurred, no blacks should be in the army. No blacks should be encouraged to join. If any volunteered, they should not be enlisted. And any black men who had somehow gotten into the Continental Army, and there were a number, uh, if they were not uh, serving in a way that brought uh, honor to the Continental Army or respect to the Continental Army, they would be expelled. Um, they just wanted to get rid of, of black people, uh, black men in general in the army. And this is exactly at the point where Jacob is wanting to enlist. Now on October 31st, and keep that date in mind, the well, end of October, Washington's general orders said, as many officers and others have begun to enlist men for the Continental Army, uh, uh, and particularly black men here, he wants an immediate stop put to that. And the enlistments returned to those black men. And that no person in the future presumed to, when it says interfere in this matter, means enlist black men into the army. And then he, at the end of this, this order, it says, and as Congress has bought so much cloth for the army for uniforms, anybody except Negroes, except black men who sign an enlistment will be supplied with clothing. So it's only going to be white men that are supplied with clothing. Uh, Congress does not want to enlist again, he says in his orders. But he's making it clear to the army that black men are not wanted. Just a couple of weeks later in November, he ordered that neither Negroes boys unable to bear arms, nor old men unfit to endure the fatigues of the campaign are to be enlisted. Now notice, boys unable to, be, unable to bear arms is a indefinite statement. What's too young? What's too old? Uh, they don't put uh, years on that. There's no definition. It's kind of left up to the judgment of the officer enlisting. Is the boy, although young, is he big enough and mature enough to serve well, regardless if he's at a young age? Is an older man, say over the age of 50, because uh, age of 50 was generally the senior um, age for militia uh, obligations, uh, obligated duty. Is an older man fit for uh, duty? then why not enlist him? However, there's no leeway for black men. If you're black, you just don't get accepted. It's not, well, if you can serve well, we'll take you. It was just none should be accepted. So it was a, a complete, uh, uh, don't come. <laughs> In practice, however, recruiters may also have used their judgment regarding black men. And if they uh, had a black man apply whom they thought could do the job well and would not bring discredit to them as the recruiter, they might allow that man in. Well, uh, in late October, remember that date of October 31st and, and what's going on in the army, somehow Jacob enlisted in the Continental Army for one year. He went to Cambridge where the army was then, uh, keeping the British uh, locked up in Boston, uh, besieging them there. And somehow, with all of those orders that Washington was giving, Jacob got in. He joined Colonel Paul Dudley Sargent's uh, 16th Continental Regiment, which was basically a Massachusetts regiment, although it had some men from uh, New Hampshire and maybe some other New England states, but it was, it was primarily Massachusetts. And he joined Captain John Wiley's company. Uh, both uh, Sergeant and Wiley did have some family history connected to Salem. Uh, so that might have been one reason why he, he got into that particular unit. 
Now, at Cambridge, when he enlisted, the British Army was in Boston. And as he says, um, I remained with the regiment at Cambridge and in the neighborhood of Boston until the British were driven out. Well, that's going to happen in March of 76. And he's going to be there even longer, as we'll see. When the British left in Boston, left Boston in March, uh, the army with Jacob uh, took themselves to Roxbury, uh, much south of where they had been um, in Cambridge, and went over land over the, the, the neck that then separated uh, virtually the island of Boston from the mainland. And from there, they were ordered to Bunker Hill. And from there, they were ordered to Castle William, the island of Castle William in, in Boston Harbor. And it was while they were at Castle William, we're getting up into July now, the British left in March. So we got April, May, June, June. you know, it's been four or five months since the British got out of Boston and he's been at, at Castle Island. Now, they come into Boston in the middle of July to hear the Declaration of Independence read. And Jacob definitely heard the Declaration of Independence read in the heart of Boston on July 18th, just before, a day or two before his regiment left to join uh, with Washington at uh, near Manhattan, near New York. It's also important to note that the mission of the army changed uh, because of the Declaration of Independence. No longer fighting for uh, equal rights with people in Britain, uh, you know, perhaps having their own uh, legislature that would not be dependent on parliament, but would answer to the king rather than parliament. Um, you know, just a better situation while, while being part of England. Now they're going to get away from England altogether and become a new country. So anybody fighting before the Declaration of Independence might object to the whole idea of independence and might, quote unquote, become a loyalist uh, instead of continuing to fight. So every, every man in the army at that point had to make that decision, whether it was stay in the army or, or get out. Most men stayed, of course, and Jacob was certainly one who did. From Boston, they were going to go to New York, where the British were threatening to take over the New York City and Long Island area. Uh, at this point, they already controlled uh, Staten Island. And his regiment is going to come to New York via Long Island Sound. They're going to, they're going to come by, by ship, the, the last part. And they're going to go through the uh, pass known as Hellgate because of the nasty currents that, that go there, although it's really derived from a uh, Dutch word that's much more peaceful than it sounds there. Uh, but then they're going to be uh, quartered, they're going to be stationed at what was known as Horn's Hook, uh, which is right on one uh, edge of, of Hell, Hellgate on the East River. And there, you know, just a map here to show you you see Horn's Hook in the upper left and uh, arrow to it. And across from it, across the East River, that Hallett's Point uh, is, was going to be a British outpost. Uh, he says, and this is again from Jacob's pension application, we threw up breastworks at Horn's Hook and the British threw up works on Long Island on the opposite shore. And they shot at each other, they fired each other, and they were there for some time. So for several weeks, uh, Jacob at Horn's Hook suffered from artillery bombardment from the British at Hallett's Point. And he was also part of the uh, army that fired artillery back at them. But it was really a brutal back and forth. By the middle of September, after the uh, Battle of Long Island and the British uh, taking 
post on Manhattan and forcing the Americans to withdraw up Manhattan Island. The uh, men uh, in the Continental Regiments at Horns Hook are going to have to get out of there and they're going to retreat and they're going to become involved in the Battle of Harlem Heights in the middle of September. And Jacob and his regiment are going to be right in the thick of things at, at the Battle of Harlem Heights. After that, you know, it took a while. It's not going to be till October 28th. Uh, the Battle of White Plains up in Westchester County. And Jacob is going to be involved in that also. And I think there's one really interesting phrase in his pension application. He said, I stood sentinel that night in a thicket between American camp and the hill so near the British lines that I could hear the Hessians in the garrison, which was between a quarter and half mile from me. So again, he was, was right in the, the thick of uh, things at White Plains. After White Plains, the Americans stayed kind of in that area until uh, December. And then you know that Washington retreated across New Jersey. Um, this is not a map of that, but this is a map of how, how Jake, Jacob got across New Jersey. He did not retreat with Washington across New Jersey uh, and then cross at Trenton to get over to Bucks County in early December. He was with the group of uh, the um, soldiers left behind with General Charles Lee in Westchester County. Almost half of Washington's army, uh, Washington left behind because he didn't know if the British were going to go up north towards West Point area or if they were going to follow him across New Jersey. When he found out the British were following him, he told Lee, okay, get over here with me and you know, I, I need you over here. You know that Lee was not real good about following orders from Washington. He felt he was better than, than Washington in many ways. So Lee is going to take this uh, really awkward looking path across New Jersey, uh, partly because he wanted to try to attack the back of the British who were chasing Washington, but that never happened. And we know that uh, by the middle of December, by December 13th, uh, General Lee was captured at a tavern uh, near Basking Ridge, and General Sullivan took command and led the men the rest of the route that you see here until they got down to uh, number 17 on the map in the lower left-hand corner, which was uh, McConkie's Ferry, December 25th. And then they would go across. So Jacob was in that group of men who joined with Washington under General Sullivan just a couple of days before the crossing. They had not been you know, camped out in Bucks County for several weeks like the uh, soldiers under Washington had. So now we get back to, to where we started, Jacob crossing and serving at the Battle of Trenton. Now, at the bat when Jacob was being asked to re-enlist, at the end of December, it's important to know why he didn't accept the offer to re-enlist. He was only about 15 miles from where he had been born. Okay, Just coming up, he would have had to walk up through uh, Ewing and Hopewell and get into uh, Amwell Township. But, you know, it's only about 15 miles. He hadn't seen or heard from his mother for over a decade. Now remember, it's his family is he and mom. He's no brothers and sisters. He doesn't know who his father is. So he's been separated from his one family member uh, for the, much most of that uh, growing up period of his life when he was indentured. He says in his uh, pension statement that one reason he didn't extend, as you see in the blue here, I did not know my family name, but called myself Jacob Gulick or Hulick after Mr. Hulick, uh, who he had lived with. This was one of the men who had owned his indentured time. And he used that name when he enlisted in the Continental Army. 
So if you ever look for records on Jacob Francis in the Continental Army, you won't find any because he was Jacob Hulick. Unfortunately, you don't find too many of those either, but there's some. He wanted to go home and he did. He went that 15 miles and he found his mother. She wasn't really well. Uh, she probably didn't live too much longer, but he first thing he asked mom is who the heck am I? What is our family name? And he found out the family name was Francis. And so, as he says, from then on, even though he had been Jacob Gulick, probably ever since he went to the West Indies in about 1767 or so, when he needed a name for the passenger list, uh, from then until after the Battle of Trenton, he was Jacob Gulick. But for the rest of his life as an adult, he's going to be Jacob Francis. Now, once he found his mother, he's almost 23 years old, and he needs to set about trying to build a settled life for himself. He uh, doesn't want to be indentured. He doesn't want to be enslaved, obviously. Uh, he wants to make a, a good life for himself. He's had the example of the five men who owned his time and their families. Uh, and like I say, several of them were farmers. So. He decides he's going to be a good farmer. He's going to be successful that way. And within three years, and this is still during the revolution, he owned a house and 46 acres of land in Amwell. The Amwell tax records for 1870 show him to be one of only two free black men listed as owning land in the entire Amwell township. And Amwell township at that time was huge. It was the biggest uh, township in Hardin County. Uh, just, just very well populated. So it was a lot of people. To be one of only two black men who own land is, is amazing. He also signed into his local militia company. Uh, he was not trying to get out of the army by not extending his enlistment. Excuse me, he was not trying to get out of the war by not extending his enlistment. He was just changing how he was serving. And he served in the 3rd 100 Regiment, which was all of Hamwell Township. And his captain that he signed into the company of was Captain Philip Snook, whom he may have known as a child because this man was the brother in law of a man named Henry Wamba, who was the first owner of Jacob's indenture time. So now that Jacob is back in Amwell Township as a young adult in his 20s, he's actually among people who knew him as a child and whom he knew when he was a little kid, but he's now grown up. During the rest of the revolution, just as all men in New Jersey did, uh, he served a number of one month tours of duty. Uh, active duty where he would get called out. And almost every time it was to go somewhere besides Amwell Township, uh, mostly to Eastern parts of New Jersey because the British were in the, uh, you know, Staten Island, Long Island, Manhattan Island, Westchester County area. And they would send units over to New Jersey and they needed to be intercepted. So New Jersey militia would take, take care of that. He was, uh, Jacob was in several uh, combat engagements with the British. And on one occasion, he was actually captured by some Hessians uh, in, a, uh, in a conflict, in a combat near Newark. And fortunately, the way things worked out in that engagement, he was able to uh, escape the Hessians um, when they stopped paying attention to him briefly and was able to get back to his, his regular unit but he was involved with Monmouth, you know, just a, a lot of different actions in New Jersey. Uh, he, by the way, he lost his farm just as many white men did during the revolution because of the economics of the revolution, the high inflation, the, the, the whole economic uh, structure uh, was so difficult that um, many men, in, including officers, not just enlisted men, wound up in debt uh, and, and lost property and that kind of thing uh, during the, the later revolution period. But by 1789, 
you know, six years after the revolution is over. Jacob was 35 years old and finally ready to start a family. Now, to me, this doesn't mean that he didn't want to have a family and it took him 35 years. To me, this means he didn't think he was ready to support a family properly until he was about 35. Uh, he didn't want to uh, you know, have a problem for anybody but himself if he didn't succeed. So he waited until, until things were in good shape. At that point, he married an enslaved woman who was 12 years his junior, 23-year-old Mary. And she lived near him. He had probably known her for a number of years. The man who enslaved her was named Nathaniel Hunt. And there were several Nathaniel Hunts at the time in adjoining communities. And we're not sure exactly which one he was, but we got some hints. But Nathaniel Hunt sold Mary to Jacob on their wedding day. Now that brings up some very interesting questions. Uh, one of which was, who were Mary's parents? Uh, Nathaniel Hunt sold her to Jacob. What, what did her parents have to say about it? We don't know who her parents were. She didn't know who her parents were. She only knew her owner, her enslaver, was Nathaniel Hunt, and she'd been living with Nathaniel Hunt for as long as she could remember. Does that mean Nathaniel was her father uh, by one of his enslaved women? He owned more than one enslaved person. Um, was she um, the daughter of another enslaved person that, that he owned? Uh, we just don't know. We also wonder why, since he basically treated Mary almost like a daughter on their wedding day, the wedding was at his house, um, he had given Jacob permission, obviously, for their courtship and then for their marriage. Uh, why didn't Nathaniel Hunt just free her so she could get married to Jacob, who was free? Well, there was a, a real reason for it. If he had freed her and then she married Jacob, New Jersey law had it that if Mary ever needed to go uh, for public assistance, if you know their economics failed and she needed public assistance, Nathaniel Hunt would be responsible for you know providing that. If he freed her and sold her to Jacob, he wouldn't have any worry about her. It would be Jacob's problem if she ever got into problems. And if Jacob freed her, which he did, then Jacob you know continued to be responsible for her. So Nathaniel Hunt, by selling Mary to Jacob, uh, got rid of a, an economic a potential obligation in the future that, that would have been ugly. It's my personal opinion that he probably sold Mary to Jacob for a very token amount, just so it would be a legal sale. I don't think he was trying to uh, make money on the sale or recoup money uh, from, from when he bought her, if he, if he did. I don't think that at all. But I think that he needed to have a legitimate uh, sale. So anyway, so many questions about their wedding. It's important that uh, Mary, that Jacob did free Mary because when they started having children, if he hadn't done that, believe it or not, uh, not only was Mary Jacob's slave, but her children would have been enslaved to Jacob also. Okay. Now, by 1801 or so, Jacob had a much larger farm uh, near Flemington. And we find on an 1851 map, a farm just north of Trenton labeled N. Francis. And this was probably uh, Nathaniel Francis, who was Jacob's son, and who took over his farm uh, when Jacob retired. Uh, we know from tax records, uh, you know, the size of the, the farm, etc. And we know that it was associated with the town of Flemington. When Jacob was getting old enough that he wanted to 
leave the farm to Nathaniel and move into the town of Flemington itself. Uh, he and Mary, probably somewhere around 1810, began renting a house from the Flemington Baptist Church. Now, if any of you know the town of Flemington, you know Church Street and Main Street corner, there is a large Baptist church there that obviously doesn't date back to the uh, early 1800s. It's, it's later 1800s, I think, or early 1900s. Uh, back at that time, it was just a, a wooden building, uh, not the big uh, stone building that it is today. But Mary and, and uh, Jacob belonged to that church. They joined that uh, Baptist church and rented their home from them for, as you can see, uh, close to 20 years. While they were there, they set up uh, a little shop in their house uh, where Mary made ginger cakes and homemade root beer that became quite popular um, in Flemington. Uh, not only did the church members, you know, after church on Sunday, maybe stop by to, uh, to have some root beer and ginger cakes, but other people would stop by there all the time. And in fact, you see, I hope you can see the, uh, the yellow there, right at, directly across Main Street from them, a school uh, was developed right around the time that they moved there, which was going to be the Flemington Academy, a kind of a private school. And Mary and Jacob made sure that those school kids got ginger cakes and root beer uh, whenever they had recess. Or if the families had uh, group picnics and things like that on Sundays on the school grounds, uh, they would almost always hire Jacob and Mary to provide the ginger cakes and root beer. It's my personal belief that Jacob and Mary tried to get as friendly with that uh, school as they could in order to get schooling for their younger children. A couple of their children were a little too old at this point, but they did have younger children that, that could still benefit from elementary school. We don't, there's no records that their kids ever went to the school, but they might've made friends with the teachers and the administrators enough to get some, you know, off the books, you know, behind the scenes kind of help. And, uh, almost tutoring, you know, for their, their kids. We know that their youngest child, who was born about 1811, his name was Abner, became extremely well-educated, and we'll talk more about him uh, later on. Now, they were living there in Flemington in 1826, which was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And Flemington really wanted to celebrate, as most towns in America wanted to celebrate, that 26th anniversary. So there was a parade in town that started at the uh, courthouse in town, the Hunterdon County Courthouse, and went up Main Street uh, to the Presbyterian Church where the celebration was held at the church. In that procession up the street, there were about 50 veterans of the revolution who the organizing committee had found and had them march as a group up the street. In that group, different individual men carried flags representing major battles of the revolution. And one of those flags, as you would expect, was for the Battle of Trenton. There was only one man I've ever been able to identify who was at the Battle of Trenton who was in that procession. And of course, that was Jacob. However, Jacob did not get to carry that flag. A white man carried that flag. Again, Jacob was only one of two black men even in the, in the procession. In 1829, just a couple of years after this, Jacob and Mary purchased a house across the street from where they were living in the rented house uh, from a neighbor named Peter Hayward, who was a carpenter. And I think this is a key to, to note that they were, they were moving, they were purchasing property in a white neighborhood, okay? There were no other uh, uh, black owned buildings or, or structures, even in the town of Flemington, much less in, in just their, their part of the town of Flemington. There were a number of black people who lived in Flemington, but they either rented or they lived with people that they worked for 
uh, there were still enslaved people and there were, there were free people, there were indentured uh, black people. But Jacob and Mary uh, were unique in, in owning their own home. In 1832, Jacob is going to apply for a pension uh, as a veteran. He had tried, he had, I won't say tried, he had started to apply back in uh, 1819 uh, when the pension law, the, when the first pension law went into effect, but he never completed it. The part that he didn't complete was the part listing his assets, his financial assets. Veterans had to prove a need as well as having proved service in order for that pension. And Jacob obviously felt absolutely no need. Um, you know, he was, his kids were doing well and he was, uh, he was doing fine. Um, you know, he had purchased his own house in, in 1829, just three years, uh, well, he would purchase his own house, I would say in 1829. Um, he was renting a house then. Um, so by 1832, they no he no longer needed to uh, justify the pension economically, and he was also, you know, getting getting older. To make his application, he had to go to the uh, Hunterdon County Courthouse in Flemington, and here's a drawing of what it looked like at that time, and here's a photograph of what it looks like today. Um, the building is still there. Uh, we can go visit the building where Jacob Francis made his pension application, um, and it's still there. Interesting to note that in the records of when this uh, building was built in 1828, just four years before he applied for his pension, several of his uh, sons are in the, the records as having um, been paid for labor on building this uh, structure. So it's got a lot of connection to his life also. Well, Jacob is getting older, and in 1836, on March 19th, he made his will, and then he would die uh, just a couple months later on July 26th. I think it's important to note that Jacob signed his will with his mark, whereas, whereas two of his sons, who were going to uh, be administrators of the will, signed with their full names. Uh, this, again, shows how Jacob was able to get his kids uh, schooled, and you know, again, more evidence that 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 he certainly did that uh, while he was living in in Flemington. There is a question that his will raises, and that question is in his bequests. Uh, the item uh, highlighted, he bequeaths um, some cash to his son Asa. Notice the phrasing, my son Asa. The next bequest is to Phoebe, daughter of my beloved wife, Mary. Why wouldn't he say here also, my daughter, Phoebe? Why wouldn't he say up above, Asa, son of my beloved wife, Mary? Well, he had about a half a dozen children, and Every one of them was phrased like he phrased for Asa, my son or my daughter. Phoebe is the only one he attributed to Mary. She was also the firstborn. She was born probably what would be early uh, in Mary's, uh, not early in her pregnancy, but earlier for her to deliver her in pregnancy from their marriage. It's very likely that Mary was pregnant with Phoebe when they got married, but probably early enough not to show since there's no mention of her being pregnant or uh, anything like that in information about their wedding. So this raises the question, who was Phoebe's father? Was Nathaniel Hunt who sold her to Jacob, uh, her, the father? Was another one of his enslaved persons the father? We just don't know. But we know that Jacob raised Phoebe like his own daughter. Uh, but it's, and this is the only time uh, it appears that he may not have been her father. Um, and I think I think it's it's very likely. Uh, Phoebe, like I say, was born uh, about seven months or so after their marriage. Their next son wasn't going to be born for about another two years. 
uh, before they had a son. Well, Jacob's uh, obituary or death notice in the local Flemington paper was really unusual. I've highlighted a couple of things. Uh, notice that he is highlighted as a hero of the revolution. He's also highlighted as being a colored man, which was uh, customary in those days uh, to identify a black man. Uh, but he was a soldier of the revolution. In addition, the uh, notice talks about him being a 30 year member in the Baptist church, the one they rented their house from for so long, that he had raised a large family in a manner credible to his judgment and his Christian character and lived to see them doing well, that his fidelity and good conduct as a soldier were the subject of remark and received the approbation of his officers. Keep in mind, those people would be the officers of the local militia, not the continental officers he served under. The continental officers had completely lost track of him by this point. They were living up in New England. It was his hundred and county uh, Amwell township officers that he had served under in the militia who were commenting on him. And the writer says, deservedly respected by all who knew him. The writer of his death notice was the editor of the newspaper. It was not a relation of Jacobs. It was a white man uh, commenting on uh, a black man that he knew uh, from the town that he, he served as, as editor of the paper. I think this is an indication that Jacob was very well known, uh, very much into the uh, culture of uh, Flemington and was, I believe, got this long a obituary because the editor found him to be unusual. Um, the editor who wrote death notices for white men seldom, if ever, went into this much detail. Uh, it was mostly just a notice, uh, no description of the person or their life. So I think this uh, says quite a lot. When I wanted to uh, research Jacob, I wanted to find his uh, burial spot. I knew from the church records of the Baptist church that he was buried in their cemetery right there in, in Flemington. But I also knew that as a black man in the 1830s, he may not have been buried in the cemetery proper. He may have been on the edge of the cemetery or if he was buried in the cemetery, he might not have had a, a tombstone. But I went looking for it and I went and I couldn't find it at first. All I was finding were white people that I, I knew from uh, learning about the history of Flemington. But then I was walking behind this hedge that you see by the uh, entry to the parking lot of the church. And I went and I looked over to see the names and by golly, there was Jacob Francis. Completely surprised me. And then I looked at the stone next to him, and it was Mary Francis. Mary, who had died several years later after him in 1844, but who only got a brief death notice, uh, being a colored woman dying at an advanced age. Uh, this was much more like the uh, a normal death notice, by the way. So there they are, side by side. And all the other tombstones you see here are for white people who were uh, the same uh, time period as them. When I found that, that uh, tombstone and I was talking with people from the Flemington church who happened to be there when I found it, nobody knew that A, he was black or B, that he was a veteran of the revolution. Well, I visited several times, and one time when the uh, cemetery caretaker was there, he and I got into a talk about it, and he was able to find a veteran's marker that he put there. I assume it's still there. I don't know. I've been there in a while, but I, I know it was there for several times that I visited. Sometime in the spring, the New Jersey SAR and DAR are going to put a historical marker um, somewhere near the site of Jacob's uh, resting place there. 
And the historical marker sign will look like what you see here on the right. That's a, a, a mock-up of it. And again, that will be happening sometime this spring. I don't know of the exact date yet. But anyway, Jacob is uh, getting some acknowledgement of who he was and the importance that he, he played in life. I think it's important to ask the question, why did Jacob Francis enlist in the army? And we know from his youngest son, Abner, remember I said Abner was one who became so well-educated in 1848, Abner was actually working for Frederick Douglass in the abolition movement and was doing writing for him, as well as attending um, um, regional meetings, etc. And he said, I should like to have the world know that the same principles of 76 to throw off the British yoke actuated my father to shoulder his musket and serve through the bloody contest. And not only my father's, but the blood of colored men was freely shed in that struggle for national independence. So Abner was obviously proud of his father, but also had obviously learned from his father of his father's uh, dedication to that cause. And Abner, as I say, carried on in the fight for abolition for the rest of his life and became uh, quite well known in, in abolition circles. Uh, for fighting not just for abolition, but for equal rights for, uh, for Black people. So that's just a, a quick <laughs> review of the life of a free Black man, uh, just to kind of sum up things a little bit. Uh, that revolutionary world included Amwell and Flemington, as well as Trenton, Salem and Boston, New York, and it included life under three, at least three flags. The British flag when uh, Jacob was born in 1754, the uh, continental flag in uh, the time he was in the revolution, and then the state of New Jersey flag uh, given here in its 1836 ver version. Um, and so he went from being British to being American and all the revolutions and everything in between. And just a quick plug for my other books. <laughs> okay. And with that, I would welcome any questions. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to submit them using the, the chat or the Q&A feature um, in the Zoom dashboard there. So uh, let's get underway. Um, you kind of addressed this uh, right at the the end, but uh, from the records found about Jacob Francis, um, does any indicate why he might have joined the Continental Army versus becoming a British loyalist or not fighting at all? No, I I, I think it's only the the positive, you know, that that Abner gives and everything there. Um, I he Salem. And the people that he lived with in Salem were strong patriots. Um, the man who owned his indenture time was in the local militia. Um, you know, had had done a lot of things with with the patriot cause, and the, of course, the people that he hung out with, you know, were the same. Um, so I don't think there was ever a, a question of Jacob being a loyalist. I think the the other question might be, why did he join and not just try to live as a free man in in New England? And I think that um, there was just so much going on, and it's, it's probably so difficult to be able to know that the Continental Army seemed to be more of a, well, I want to say a guaranteed job. Although, as you notice from what uh, they were going through, it was hardly a guaranteed job until uh, late December of 1775, when Washington went against all those orders that he did and said, okay, now we'll accept uh, Black men, and particularly any who were already in the army like Jacob was. That pretty much gave him then uh, a guaranteed job, if you will, during the period of his enlistment. 
Um, was there any record of a slave sale between Jacob and Nathaniel Hunt? And if so, what type of record would that have been? I've never run across one. Um, it, it could be that it was a, a personal thing. Uh, it could be that there was a copy of it that was given to a county court. Um, if, if so, it hasn't survived. Um, I'm sure that there was some kind of documentation. Nathaniel Hunt would have wanted to be able to prove the sale. Even, even, and, and certainly Jacob would need to prove that his wife was his and, and that he had manumitted her. Um, do you know if any of Jacob's sons or grandsons, if H. Elmo fought in the War of 1812? No, I don't believe any of them did. I've never come into any records of, of that. And then most of them, well, Abner would have been too young. Let's put it that way. And and the next oldest would have been way too young. Um, it would have been only the boys who were were the oldest, and they were they were actually much older. And they they would have had families. They would have been settled. So uh, they probably wouldn't have. Are your books available locally? <laughs> <laughs> well. They are available at Washington Crossing Park on the Pennsylvania side in the gift shop, for sure. Uh, they're available in Flemington at Act Two Books, uh, which is not far from where Jacob actually lived in, in Flemington. Um, they're available online uh, from Amazon. Um, they have been available at a few other places, but I'm not sure if they still are. But I know for sure that those other places have them, and they're always available online. Did your research reveal many other African American soldiers with experiences similar to Jacob's? No, not with experiences exactly like his. There were a number of men who were free blacks um, who joined the Continental Army. They had not necessarily been indentured, you know, in, in earlier life. They, you know, had been totally free their whole life. Um, most, most of the free Black men joined regiments from the state that they were from, not the state they just happened to be living in at that time in their life. Um, there were other free Black men in Jacob's regiment. Um, I don't know all of them and all of them by name. I do know that one man made the records only because he committed some kind of an offense that caused him to be court-martialed and whipped, as so many men were. Um, that was almost certainly a weekly occurrence, if not a daily occurrence. Um, flogging was, was so common. I think it's to Jacob's credit that there are no records of him ever being flogged in the in the Continental Army. Um, he apparently, you know, kept very straight in terms of how he obeyed orders. But I think it's important to know that in all of the virtually all of the New England regiments, it's very likely that there were black men at the same time that, that Jacob served. Certainly we know of the Marblehead Regiment which came from the town right next to Salem and the Marbleheaders that helped uh, get Washington across the Delaware. There were a number of black men in that regiment, but it was very, it was common in the New England regiments to have at least some black men. Um, have you ever been invited to any reunion of the descendants of Jacob Francis? Um, and if so, did you learn of any possessions that might've been handed down through the generations? I would have loved to have been able to identify some descendants of, of Jacob Francis. In my attempts to follow the lines of his children down to more modern times, I ran into dead ends on just about on really all of them. And so I don't, I would not be surprised to somehow um, be able to verify that he has no living descendants. Um, I know the SAR and the DAR are very interested right now to see if um, any, they, they have in, in their records, there's nobody who ever applied 
you know, as a descendant of his, and they are on the lookout and see if anybody does, because they're going to let me know if, if a descendant you know, shows up. But I, either his his boys uh, in in the next generation or so did not have children. Uh, the women, the, the girls, uh, their lines kind of run into uh, dead ends in terms of the records and that sort of thing. Um, I don't think that too many of his grandchildren anyway had children. Uh, what were his duties in the army, especially as a black man that he wasn't even supposed to be able to enlist? Well, his duties were the same as for a white man. Um, I don't know how to say it any other way. Um, as far as the army was concerned, he was, quote, just another soldier. Uh, we had a few uh, questions all uh, essentially um, on how did you get in interested in researching about Jacob? <laughs> well, I ran into his pension application when doing uh, some research on the New Jersey militia uh, for an earlier book. And Jacob, at that point uh, in his life, didn't really fit into the scope of that book. But his pension application is quite long. The, the statement that he made to qualify for the pension was much longer than it had to be. And so I, I learned quite a bit about his life and it, it was just fascinating to me. And then I started looking, finding other tax records and you know things like that, church records, other things that began to show me that, that he really had a, a pretty extraordinary life. So it was something that dwelt with me for well over 10 years and was finally, I decided, okay, it's time to do a book on him. Um, it, it was just too good a story. And I think important a story. Um, how does one get a, an SAR and DAR plaque for an African-American Revolutionary War soldier? Uh, yeah, you'd have to check with the, uh, with your local SAR or check with the cemetery, uh, and the, 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 uh, caretaker for the, the, the cemetery, uh, whoever's in charge of it. They, they, they would be able to help you with that. Um, you touched on this before, but maybe elaborate a, a little bit more. Have you discovered um, any other Black revolutionary figures? Well, <laughs> yes. I mean, there, there are so many uh, Black men served in the revolution. You, you do run into them when, when you're researching. Um, I think it's, you know, an important story. And uh, there are several books that have been written in the last few years that deal with uh, Black soldiers from various colonies and, and states. Um, new, new, new material is being discovered all the time. Um, but there were hundreds, if not thousands, uh, of Black men who at one time or another served. Um, many more later in the war than early in the war. But as you can see from Jacob and from uh, the Marbleheaders and others, from day one, there were Black men serving uh, in the cause, um, either in the militia or in the Continental Army. And um, it's, it's just the story of the revolution could be told through the story of Black men as well as by white, through white men. Don't see any more questions. Um, you do have tons of accolades in the chat um, for your your dedication and uh, tremendous research um, for for telling this this story. All right. Well, I don't. See, as I said, I don't see any more questions. So I think we could go ahead and end it there. Um, I'd like to to thank you so much, Larry, for. For presenting on this and you know 
making Patriots Week what it is and continuing um, the memory of those that that served um, in, in the American Revolution. So, and we wish you wish you luck on your future research, um, and we'd love to have you have you back. Great, thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you everybody for tuning in and hoping it was enjoyable and 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 informative. And well, just everybody be safe, be well, and hopefully we'll see you at another program.